Okay. What do you have to say? I uh, say uh, good evening. Hello. Good evening. Uh, welcome. Oh, really to welcome to Oceanside Week of Prayer. Yes. Okay. Yes. We're glad you're here. That's what you. Okay. Go ahead. Welcome to Oceanside. Welcome to. <laughs> delete. <laughs> Keep going. Can you delete it, Kevin? Please. No, okay. he's, he's gonna do the editing. Hi there. Welcome to Oceanside Seventh Day Adventist um, Week of Prayer. We are happy you can be with us. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi! Welcome to Oceanside Adventist Church for the week of prayer! We're glad you're here! Yay! We all pray together, okay? Remember! Ah. Nice, 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 nice. <laughs> Stay safe! <laughs> Don't you be afraid Joy comes in the morning Troubles they don't last always For there's a friend named Jesus Who will wipe your tears away And if your heart is broken Just lift your hands and say I know that I can stand, no matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. You don't have to worry, and don't you be afraid. Joy comes in the morning, troubles they don't last always. For there's a friend named Jesus who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, Oh, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way. I can take it with him I know I can stand no matter what may come my way my life is in your hands when your tests and trials they seem to get you down and all your friends and loved ones are nowhere to there's a friend named Jesus who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, Oh, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way. With him I know I can stand, no matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. With Jesus I can take it, with him I know I can stand, no matter what may come my way.
Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, for our family. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for the doctors that we can see, the hospitals we can go to. We thank you for our friends that we can speak to. We also ask you to especially be with some of our friends, Jet, Bill Jones, Halia Buick, Sherman Scheid, Joan and Bill Hade, Jonathan Chung, the Watson family, Tapa'u family, all the kids going back to school, all the medical professionals, and those prayers that are not spoken. Please be with us, Lord. We ask you to be with us whose hearts are broken. We ask you to be with us whose bodies are weak. Be with us who are struggling in whatever way that takes away the peace that you offer to us. Please heal us, Lord, so that we can have the peace. We ask you to be with us this week, be with our parents, our children, our spouses as we go out into the community. Keep us safe. We ask you to hear your voice, Lord, so that we can make the right choices and be in our hearts especially. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Should I start like this? <laughs> All right. Hi guys, my name's Eric, for those of you don't, who don't know me, and uh, I just want to tell you a little story about um, what happened to me January 30th of this, this year. So about, I don't know, eight months ago. I was working, um, cutting a window open, and uh, I was using a Sawzall, and Sean, who was working with me was using a skill saw and uh, my hand just got too close to his blade and this is what happened. So immediately after um, my, my hand contacted the blade, I said, oh my God, you cut my fingers off. 
And I looked down and I saw my fingers laying on the floor and he jumped down and was running around just crazy. And I go, grab my fingers, we gotta go to the hospital. And so he's, I go outside because I'm feeling a little lightheaded. I, I didn't pass out, but I, you know, I saw my hand for about a second and I got a little woozy. So I, I walked outside to get fresh air and he and another guy named David scrambled around to find my fingers. Well, they could only find two fingers. And uh, he comes running out. He's like, Eric, we can only find two of your fingers. And I go, well, just grab them. Let's go. <laughs> so he puts them in a bag of ice, a, sand, or a bread bag with ice, and he puts the fingers right on top. He sets them in his cup holder with a coffee cup, a regular mug. And the first corner we take, the fingers fall on the floor on the floor mats. I go, dude, you got to pick my fingers up. So I can't do it, man. And I go, I go, Sean, pick up my fingers. So he's reaching under the floor under his legs and he's like, ice, ice, finger. And he starts to almost throw up. And I go, man, just put it in the bag. <laughs> he gets one and he struggles. He gets the other one. And the whole time we're going, and he's like, I'm going to pass these guys on the right-hand side. I'm going to go up over the curb. And I go, man, just slow down. <laughs> I go, I want to get to the hospital in one piece. So we get to the hospital. He grabs the bag of fingers. Oh, at this, right after it happened, he took his shirt off, and he put it over my hand, and we get in his car and we go. So we get to the hospital. He's shirtless, and he's got tattoos from his shoulders all the way down to his fingernails on both, both arms. So he's topless, and I walk into the hospital holding his shirt over my hand, and uh, he goes, he just cut his fingers off! He yells it right in the middle of the waiting room, and everybody turns around, and they're looking at us, and their mouths are open, and they didn't know what to do for a few seconds, and they grab me and they say, okay, come in this room. And so we get there. Mind you, they only have two fingers. And so uh, anyways, it takes them two hours and they find the other finger. It's still in the skill saw, in the guard. And they go back and they find it, they bring it back. And by the grace of God, there's an, a surgeon there that's a hand surgeon. And she uh, does my surgery that, that same night. It was a 10 hour surgery. And the whole time I'm telling myself, count it all joy, brethren, when you face various trials, which is in James 1, 2. And I just was, was praying, Lord, we're going to get through this, right? And I wasn't stressed out. I wasn't worried. I just knew that, that God had me. And uh, I forgot to tell you, on the way to the hospital, I'm trying to call Ann, my wife, and tell her, hey, I cut my fingers off. But my whole body's in pain. Everything I touch just hurts. And so I grab the phone, and I'm swiping with my nose, and I'm dialing with my nose, and I'm, I'm thanking God for my, my big nose. I was able to call her, and I said, Ann, I cut my fingers off. It's not a joke. And she goes, okay, bye. And she showed up almost at the same time I was getting into the room. She was there. And so anyways, um, from that moment on, they reattached my fingers. And for six months, well, for eight days, I was in ICU. And... Um, I wasn't stressed out. The surgeon kept telling me, hey, there's this thing called ICU psychosis, and I'm worried that you might get it, where you just get panic attacks and you can't handle being cooped up. So they would let me walk around the perimeter of the building, and I was able to go take a shower and things like that. Most people in ICU don't stand up. They're just unconscious and they're heavily sedated. So every time I stood up to go to the restroom, all the nurses would look at me like, something crazy was happening and they'd go are you okay what are you doing and anyways it was kind of fun so after that i started getting leech therapy where they put leeches on my fingers and so you would have to stick a needle in the, my fingertip to draw blood and then attach the leech so i was i was teaching leech therapy to each nurse that would come on in the icu and when they would stab my finger sometimes i would go ah and they would jump because they, they thought they hurt me, but I had no feeling in my fingers. So I was just kind of messing with them. But anyways, it was kind of fun. I, I was kind of getting bored in there, so it gave me something to do. After eight days, I went home and I stayed home for about a month and a half and uh, went 
went right back to work. I was running jobs and, and doing things like that. Um, there was no time in that whole six month period that I really got depressed or overcome with, with grief or anything. The time that it came was um, the fingers didn't live. There was an issue and, and they just didn't make it. So um, I had to go in for a second surgery. They amputated my fingers and this is what was left. So um, the next day there was some bleeding and so I went back in and they unwrapped it. And right then I just kind of went into shock. I was just, oh my goodness, that's hor horrific. And uh, so I had a period of grief and uh, a little bit of depression for, I don't know, maybe a week. And then once the stitches came out and I started using my hand again, I realized that I could do everything that I was doing previously. Um, just a little bit slower, uh, a little bit different technique. And so I, I've been able to adapt through the grace of God um, to different scenarios. I, I haven't gotten angry or, I mean, angry at all. Uh, there was a time I was trying to tighten a wire nut and I couldn't do it with my right hand because I still had um, gauze and protection on there. And it, for about 20 minutes, I fought it and fought it. And finally, I just took a breath and I said, Lord, I'm going to just walk away from that for right now. And uh, the peace of Christ came over me and I just allowed somebody else to do it. So I've, I've learned to ask for help in certain situations and allow others to help me. So um, I don't know if I needed more humility. But <laughs> you know, I was... Um, a little embarrassed when it first happened to have the gauze off and have people see my hand like this, but gradually the embarrassment's gone. Um, my faith has been strengthened. Uh, there's joy in my heart still, and the Lord has brought me through this. And uh, I never doubted that he, he wouldn't. And I know there was a time in my life I would have been bitter and angry and uh, just given up probably and uh, I thank Christ and his sacrifice for the grace that he's given me and the mercy that he's shown me I mean if if I had cut it here or at the wrist I mean it would have been a lot different scenario so I'm I'm thankful and grateful and I'm I'm glad I was able to share this with you guys thank you hello there I want to talk to you before I go to bed. See, I'm all ready to go to bed, but I can't go to sleep. I worry about things, do you? I really do. And I shouldn't. No, because I know that I have a Heavenly Father that says, give me all your problems. Don't worry about things. In Jeremiah, book of the Bible, chapter 29, verse 11, God tells us, I have plans for you. I want to make you happy. I want to take away your thoughts that are bad. And I, I want you to know that I want you to be successful. And I believe that he does. Do you? He also says that if we think about him and God, that we don't have time to think about sad things. Now, I understand. I mean, I'm having trouble going to bed tonight and going to sleep. So I understand maybe sometimes you do too, that things are just different in our world, aren't they? We have to wear masks when we go out. We have to stay at home more. Sometimes we don't get to see the friends we want, and it makes us sad. And sometimes we get angry, and sometimes we get scared. But you know, we don't have to be. We know that Jesus loves us, and we need to remember that. But I have a solution that I'm going to try tonight to see if I can go to sleep. I have a gift box, and it's for Jesus. Now you think, why does Jesus need a gift box? He needs the gifts of my trust and your trust. He needs to know that we trust him and love him enough to give him our worries and the things that frighten us and let him take care of them so that we can go on about our life and be happy with the blessings that he does give. So I made this box and in it, I'm gonna put the things that worry me, today even. Now today, 
I stayed home. I didn't want to stay home. I wanted to get out and I wanted to go shopping. But I need to stay home right now to stay healthy. Oh, and we are planning a party for my sister-in-law. And I wanted all of our friends to come. But we can't have parties like that right now. So I planned something else. But it still makes me sad that I can't do the same thing. So I'm going to put that in my box too. And let's see. I also, I have a sister that's a ways away from me. And she's very sick right now. And I can't go see her. And I'm sad about that. And I worry about her. So I'm going to put that in my box to Jesus. And, you know, my grandsons were telling me that, Grammy, we're really sad that we don't get to go to school. We don't get to play with our friends and everything. And so I put that in my box, too, because they want to go to school soon with their friends and play with them. They want to be back with all the teachers and all that excitement. And most of all, I miss hugs. I miss coming to the Oceanside Church where I see all of you and I get hugs from my friends. I miss that so much. And sometimes I get angry because I don't have it. And sometimes I get scared wondering how long will it be before I do? And that's why they're all getting in my box and I'm gonna give it to Jesus tonight. And I'm gonna put it up on the closet shelf where I'm not going to touch it after I put those things in it. And I'm going to pray to Jesus and I'm going to see if he's going to help me go to sleep because I trust him to take care of all these things. Will you pray with me tonight? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us, each one of us, and thank you for caring about all the things that worry us and scare us. And we know that you want us to be happy and to remember our blessings. So please, Jesus, take all the things in my box, my gift box, and all the things that belong to these boys and girls that frighten them. And let them know that you will take care of them, that you will always be here for us, and that we can keep thinking about you, and that will make us think happier thoughts all the time. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for all of the wonderful things you give to us. And thank you for the good night's rest. Good night. Amen. Oh, getting sleepy. I think I feel really good now because Jesus has all my worries. I don't have any. I just have to remember that I have you for my friends. And that pretty soon we'll be able to be at church together and be able to share lots of hugs and stories. Sleep well tonight and make a box for Jesus and see if that helps you too. Good night. Hi, church family. Hello. We are so excited you're here today to join us. Mm -hmm. um, Benji and I are really excited to show you some quick, easy, and simple exercises and stretches. So wherever you are, make some room or get up from, um, if you're sitting down, uh, we're just gonna take three to five minutes and we're going to try to relax our mind and body. Mm. Um, I know today that we are all experiencing some sort of stress, some sort of anxiety, a lot of worry right now. Mm -hmm. And I just want to take the time to put that aside and just uh, join us right now. Okay, Yay. so first we're going to start off with some deep breathing. So we're going to go up and down and we're going to remember to inhale and exhale. Okay, ready? Going up, inhale. Exhale as you go down. One more time. And maybe one more time too. Okay, and I know that if you're sitting at a computer for six to seven hours a day, or you're busy with work, you're driving all day, taking care of the kids, um, it can really take a strain on your back and your shoulders and your neck. So I'm gonna show you some quick little stretches for that. So we're gonna go forward with our neck and just hold it for three seconds. So forward, one, two, three. We're gonna go back. One, two, three. 
and then we're gonna go to the right one two three and then the left one two three mm. perfect and you could do some neck rotations to get it all loose and we're going to um, also do some shoulder rolls so we're going to go forward and we're going to inhale and then exhale as you go to a neutral position so inhale forward again forward and then we're going to go backwards one more time okay and now Benji is going to show you some alternative exercises for the kids or if you're able yeah if you're able please get low into the ground with me por favor thank you ah. first stretch is going to be the butterflies we all awesome. know those awesome put your feet together just press to the ground Hold it there for about five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Woo! Perfect. Now we're gonna do some ankle twisters. <laughs> gonna stick your leg out, your left one or your right, whichever one you prefer. And bring your opposite or your opposite leg back towards yourself. And you're gonna hold on to it. Put your hand on your foot, mm -hmm. bottom, palm, yeah. And we're just gonna twist forward for three seconds. One, two, three. And now we're gonna bring it back. Three seconds. One, two, three. And now we switch. Nice. We're gonna go forward for three seconds. One, two, three. And now back. One. Two, three. Great. Awesome. Woo. Perfect. So that concludes day one of Week of Prayer, and see you guys tomorrow. Yay, boy. <laughs> Good evening, church family. I'm Brianna Noble. I'm 18 years old, and I'm a youth assistant here at Oceanside. And I am very excited to be able to kind of discuss with you guys hope in difficult times. Now, before I begin, when Pastor Kevin first asked me to kind of talk about what hope looks like in difficult times, um, I thought I needed to know all the answers, and I don't know all the answers. And when I first was kind of considering, you know, what does hope mean to me? What does hope look like? So I want to ask you guys, what does hope look like to you? Or what might bring you hope? And it's very easy to think that maybe it's a person, an experience, a material object. And I think those are all great responses when we're talking about worldly desires. But when we're talking about trying to live a life of holiness and a life full of God and a relationship with Him, I think it's important that we understand what God wants us to find or interpret hope to mean to Him. And so when He says in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 11, Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. We find that God would hope that we seek comfort in him. And so very, it's very easy, I feel like, to feel um, the cycle of fulfillment through material possessions and objects. And we become consumed by feeling like we need this or that to feel fulfilled and to feel peace in our life. When in reality, it simply takes a relationship with God and reading through his word in the Bible. And I don't mean to sound like a hypocrite because it truly is difficult, especially for young Christians, when in a time of social media, we are bombarded by, you need this object or you need to look like this to feel completely peaceful and, and fulfilled within yourself. When in reality, God wants us to look to him when we are in need of hope and comfort. Now, like I said, I don't know all the answers, and Pastor Kevin and Pastor Eddie make it look very easy, easy when they are talking on the Sabbath because they have experience that they can relate back to, and I'm just beginning my journey with Christ and as a Christian and just a young adult in general, and so I don't have all the answers. And so when I was first asked, can I talk about hope in difficult times, 
I kind of felt like I, need, I needed the answer to give to you guys, but in reality, that's not tr the truth. And so I really had to dig deep into the word, the Bible, and just pray to God and ask that he gives me the right words to share with my church family and everyone about what it takes for comfort and hope in difficult times. Now, when I think of hope, it's often a thought that brings me comfort. And so personally, I am so thankful to learn at such a young age that I am not in control of my life. Now, when I say this, don't get me wrong, I believe that I'm in control of my actions, my thoughts, what I say, and how I say it. But when I say that I am not in control of my life, I believe that I'm trying to speak to I'm not in control of the opportunities that I will receive and the difficulties that I will endure. And so, personally, I believe that God has a plan for me and for each and every single one of you. And so, when I go through difficulties and struggles in life, I always need to tell myself that what is to be mine will be declared by God himself in my life. So, what is to be mine will be declared by God himself in my life. And I feel like this is either from something I read or just something that I've kind of taken to make my own, but I feel like I'm constantly repeating that saying to myself when something doesn't go as planned. And I feel like this is further backed up by Proverbs 19, verse 21, when they say, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And furthermore, in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And those two verses just bring me such comfort and such hope that the plan that I had for myself for the future, just because it's not going the way that I set out for it, I know that God must have something greater for me in store. And so I'm a perfectionist. I love to know what's going on, you know who's doing what. I'm very bad with spontaneous um, events and everything like that. but. I like to be in control of my life, and it's a daily struggle to give my control to God, to give my worries, to give my stresses to God, so that, because he doesn't want us to be burdened with that. He is in control, and I believe that he has a plan for us, and that it's gonna go as long as I follow him and I trust in him. And while it's easy to be consumed by the difficulties of today, the overwhelming stress, um, I just wanna take a second to think beyond our current circumstances, beyond our current state, maybe right now. And it's so important that we remember that God does not want us to struggle alone through these difficulties. Do not believe you are struggling alone, as in Deuteronomy 31.8, he says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. And I think those words are just so powerful because God does not want us to feel alone even when we are in the lowest times of our life, when we are going through the difficult, most difficult times of our life. He does not want us to feel as if we are alone and going through suffering alone. And so I think those are just such powerful words once again because he is with us even when it feels as if he is not and that we are completely alone and it is quiet. But he is with us as we are going through and struggling through these difficulties because we are becoming stronger. And not only are we becoming stronger, our character, but our relationship with him as we continue to rely on him and depend on him through to give us strength to get through these different circumstances. So lastly, I wanted to conclude with the comfort of trusting in God's plan for each and every individual. And in the end, when we look beyond our current state of sadness or struggle or pain or fear in the very moment, there is a life more beyond what we are currently facing. There is a future that he has planned out for us. And to keep in mind that our end goal is to have internal life with Jesus. And so I just wanted to give an excerpt about the beauty of heaven and what we have to look forward to. So the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And that came from Revelation 21, verse 9 through 11. And I just thought that was so beautiful. 
it sincerely gives me a sense of peace and comfort knowing that Jesus promised us eternal life with him and to live in this great home that he is specifically built just for us. I can't think of anything more beautiful than that. So to live a life beyond the one which we currently live that is laced with sin, imperfection, sadness, and difficulties, it brings me sincere hope and comfort knowing that Jesus' promise of everlasting life with him and our loved ones will be near. So I now ask that we bow our heads and put our hands together to pray. So thank you, Lord, for gathering my church family and I today to learn more about you and how you're a beacon of hope and comfort in times of difficulty. Thank you for speaking through me and giving me the knowledge and words that I need today to share with my church family. And I pray that you remain close to those who both have silent struggles and have also called out to you in times of need. We know that, you are con that we are continu continuously loved by you, and I pray that you stay close to us. In your name we pray, amen.